M. Scott Peck begins his book, The Road Less Traveled, with three very weighty and profound words that life is difficult. Amen? Life is difficult. And I was overwhelmed uh, last uh, weekend when we had our Twickenham prayer service where we prayed from noon until midnight. It was great all coming together. And if you weren't able to join us, this whole stage was filled with cards on, on every layer, and there were several hundred cards. And as I was reading through these cards and praying over the request, I was, I was really taken back by all this going on and, and the different things that, that we're concerned about and our co-workers that we took the prayer requests were. There, there were prayers and, and uh, hoping for uh, financial situations to, uh, to be remedied, for people to find work, for physical ailments, uh, to be healed, and for family situations and strife to be resolved. And so I was just taken back because you know, we, we show up on campus and how are you? Everyone's fine. But in reality, we're all dealing with some very difficult things in life. The good news for us today is if we're living life in community, burdens are lighter if they're born together. Well, we're going to study a little bit about the prophet Elijah today. And during the time of the divided kingdom, you had Saul, and then you had David, and you had Solomon, and then it divides the, the 12 tribes of Israel. You have the 10 tribes in the north, which retain the name Israel, and then the two tribes to the south are called Judah. And in these two divided kingdoms, you have both good kings and bad kings. Well, one of the most despicable kings in the north in Israel was Ahab. I personally believe that he wasn't all that bad until he came in, in contact with and united with one of the most despicable characters in all of Scripture, and that is Queen Jezebel. Well, the marriage of Ahab and, and Jezebel what was all about foreign relations and trying to improve trade routes and, and different, nego different negotiations. So as the, the kings got together and the prince was going to be married to this princess, it was negotiated that Jezebel and her entourage, when they left from their home country in Phoenicia to come over to, to live there in Israel, that she and those that she brought with her would be able to maintain her devout devotion and, and religious practices to the God of Baal. Ahab was an, was an accommodating husband, and in fact, he even built her, her his own, uh, I guess, temple to Baal there in the capital city so that she could go and worship those that came with her, much like Solomon had done for his wives. We saw how, how that turned out. But Jezebel, over time, grew dissatisfied with the prerogative of private worship. And so she cranks it up a little bit, and she starts promoting Baal as a public alternative to Yahweh worship, even installing high places for people to where they, they could go and, and worship Yahweh on, on one day and then kind of secretly go off up to the high places and start lifting up praise to Baal as well. And so the people start practicing syncretism of, of God and Baal worship at the same time. And, and really what they were saying is, hey, we're an enlightened and tolerant society. We, we can include all religions. But still that wasn't good enough for Jezebel because the next step was that they would remove Yahweh worship altogether and have outright worship of this foreign God. That was the end game. Well, why would people be tempted to uh, start worshiping Baal? Well, Baal was, was known as the, the god of fertility of the land and the god of rain. And so they're in this agricultural society where rainfall is, is, is life, death for, for their crops, and so if they can supplement their worship to God with bringing in the, the blessings of Baal so their crops grow and, and they can eat and, and be wealthy people, it made sense. And so you have the, the prophets and you have some of the religious leaders that may not have believed that, that, that Baal was important or, or Baal was powerful, but they kind of went along to get along, trying to stay in good relations with the very nasty and wicked queen. Everyone except our hero of the story, that's Elijah. And to prove that this God was a fraud, 
what Elijah ends up doing is, is declaring that for the next three years, there's going to be drought. If, if he is the, the God that provides rain and, and, and blesses the crops, we're going to show you just how foolish that is because God's not going to allow any rain to fall for three years. And so Elijah attacks the very theological center of this fraudulent religion. And then what does he do? He skips town into the desert. The, the text tells us that, that God provided for him out by this brook that he creates. And so for the first leg of this famine, Elijah is, is out there, and he's kind of off by himself. And, and as he's drinking from the brook, the, also these ravens came in, and in their talons, they, they're filled with, with meat and with bread. And so, I mean, even the peasants during good times didn't have meat at every meal. But Elijah is living it up. He is eating like a king at the table spread forth by his heavenly father. Nothing he needs is withheld. So let's pick up our story in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 7 through 9. Now, sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath, Sidon, and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. Okay, so this is a, a pretty in, incredible thing. Uh, apparently, uh, God thought that there was more to his relationship with Elijah than having just kind of this private relationship where his spiritual and physical needs are taken care of. It's just my God and I out by this brook and just enjoying God's creation and his provisions. He goes, no, I'm, I want you to go do something for me. And so he sends him off to do this. So I'm just wondering, with these spiritual needs being met and his physical needs being met, Elijah now has to come to grips. He is no longer the focus of God's ministry, but at this point in the story, he becomes the facilitator of God's ministry. Which brings us to our first point from this story, that burden-bearing, as we're talking about it, goes both ways. What exactly do you mean by that? But what I'm talking about is that we have to realize that at some times we're the focus of burden bearing and sometimes we're the facilitators of it. Because in every community, including within the church, there are those that are perpetually in need of help, whether it be spiritual help, emotional help, or physical help. But when healing comes and the finances are restored and, and the storm waters subside, and those that have rallied around you to help you, when, when that is, the need has been taken care of, God's going to provide an outlet. God's going to provide you an opportunity to return the favor. God's going to provide you a unique opportunity to go and serve and, be, and bear someone else's burdens because you have a unique experience that God wants you to use, if you're willing. Well, conversely, for those of us that, that are caregivers, that are rescuers, that are burden bearers, that's what we do. That we, we feel like that's our calling. We're looking for those that are in need and, and trying to meet those needs. There are times when the burden that needs bearing is our own. But we have to let down our pride and allow others to help us and nourish us and sustain us, to allow God to bless our lives at the time when we need it most. And sometimes it's pride that keeps us from doing that. I shared this story about six months ago, but it, I, hopefully you'll allow me to, to repeat it again. But we had a, a dead tree on our property, and it was kind of scary because it was right next to our shed. And I was afraid it was going to topple over and just destroy the shed. And so I, I asked Dave Morell if I could borrow a chainsaw. i have been certified, so I'm, I knew what I was doing. And, and so I just asking if I could borrow that so I cut down this tree and and get get rid of it off the property well the next Saturday Dave shows up with half the disaster relief team there in in all their gear and chaps and, and multiple chainsaws and they cut it down for me stacked up the wood and everything else and so it was hard for me just to allow them to do that sometimes we've got to do that well, let's keep reading first Kings 17 verses 10 
So he went to Zarephath. He went to Zarephath. Well, what we're going to see is God has compassion on this widow and her son. And God hears their cries. And, and, and God is going to send his servant there to display his compassion on this, this woman and her son, but also to display his power in Jezebel's own backyard. It's incredible for him to go into Phoenicia, the heart of Baal worship, as God's representative and say, your God is not alive. Let me tell you about the one God who is. So let's keep reading. When they came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water and a jar so I might have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called in, Bring me, please, a piece of bread. Well, as sure as the Lord, your God, she lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour and a jar and a little oil and a jug, and I'm just gathering a few sticks to take home and to make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Talk about burden. This woman has it. This this poor woman, she has little to no provisions. She's like, I got a little bit of oil, I got a little bit of flour, and but starvation is a very real possibility for this woman and her family. She also has to have guilt on a deeper level that she's unable to take care of her son. She's been given the, the task of being a caregiver, and she can't provide that care. And finally, she had to be experiencing a sense of hopelessness that the one God that, that she's cried out to, Baal, appears dead or, or out of the picture. He is no longer sustaining her. So she realizes she's on her own and she's unable to cope with the situation. She's extremely burdened. So what does Elijah tell her to do? He's like, hey, uh, I know you got all these problems and I appreciate that, but um, I, I want you to go and, and, and make me a cake. She's like, well, all I've got is just a little bit of flour. He's like, well, yeah, yeah, go ahead and um, pour all that flour out. And she, what else do you have? Well, I got some oil. He's like, oh, fantastic. Why don't you get that oil and kind of pour it in and make a big mess? And I, I want you to, to make a cake. Okay. Who's the cake for? Well, it's for me. Well, we had kind of planned for that to be for me and, and my son. What, what are we going to do? He says, well, um, in reality, I want you to go and, and make you one as well. And there should be plenty enough flour for you to make some. And, and, and I think there will be enough oil as well for you to make you a cake. And, and so sure enough, they, they sit down and they eat. And she's like, well, our bellies are full, but what about tomorrow? is it just this is our last meal he said no no i mean you should be fine you know and in fact there's plenty enough flour in there you'll find in the morning that you can just go and and make you some more flour and then you can pour some more oil in and make another cake what he's trying to do is he's attempting to change her worldview. Because what she's been operating under is a worldview of scarcity. To where she says, I have limited resources. These resources are for me and mine, and therefore they've got to be protected. He says, I want to give you a different reality, a different way of looking at things. I want to tell you about my Heavenly Father and His world of abundance. Can I tell you my story? He's a God of abundance where where resources abound. Where I'm out in the middle of a desert and He causes a brook to come forth to sustain me so I have something to drink. The ravens from the air came flying in and they they had bread and one talent and meat in the... uh, Meat, yes. Twice a day He did this. And the, this God of abundance is going to take care of you as well. And as you go, you'll see that there is flour of plenty. And there will be oil that will continue to pour forth. 
And until the day of this famine is over, the Lord is going to provide for you. The Lord is going to sustain you. And this is a message that we need to hear as well. Because it's not just widows that struggle with this idea of scarcity versus abundance. You know, I think sometimes it's easy for us to give God the credit with the blessings that we have. And what we do is we sit around the table. Dear Lord, thank you for providing for this meal in which we're about to partake. And so if you ask someone, where do your blessings go? Oh, our Heavenly Father provides for them. All this food is is the bounty of His harvest that He provides for us. And yet, we we say this, saying that God is the the one that's given us all this, but then we take our possessions and we hoard them. And and, and we kind of make sure that we have more than enough. Why? We do this in case God doesn't provide for our needs. We, we say everything comes from Him. He's the source. But just in case that source dries up, I've got to be prepared as a provider for me and my family. It's a whole different worldview. We say we believe in one, but yet in another way we're operating out of this scarcity of worldviews. We've got to do something different. A few years ago, we were living in Houston. Maggie was taking a dance class. And my mom wanted to drive down to watch her perform. And so it was kind of the end of the, of the season deal. And so my mom had left him plenty enough time, she thought, to get there. But she didn't realize the Houston traffic coming in about 4, 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. And so as she realized she's a little bit behind, she said, I didn't have time to stop and eat. I said, well, Mom, that's okay. Instead of coming all the way to our house, why don't you meet me at a subway that's right next to where she's going to be performing? So we went over there, and I had a little bit to eat, and Mom orders a foot-long tuna sub. And I'm like, wow, okay. And so she eats half of it, and then it's time for us to go to the performance. Well, she starts wrapping it up, and she puts it into her purse. I'm like, Mom, what are you doing? And she goes, well, uh, I, you know, I hate to get rid of it. I said, Mom, it, it's 105 degrees outside. You're coming here for a week. Jill has dinner on the stove. It, it's ready to go. We've got food at the house. We'll go out to eat or we'll go to the grocery store. If we don't, what'd she do? She kept that tuna in her purse as we go to this thing. And I'm glad the theme of the performance was under the sea because that smelled like tuna in the whole place. <laughs> We've got to realize that we live in, and I just wonder sometimes if, if God is looking at us in the same way. If God's looking down going, why are you so fearful? Why can't you trust me? You say on the source, allow me to demonstrate that in your life. You know, when we begin to make this shift from viewing our, our world not as a place of abundance, but a world of scarcity, then we begin operating out of fear of not having what we need. Why, why do we do that? Even the poorest of the poor here in the United States, what's their greatest problem? Is it starvation? No, it's obesity. What does that say about the land in which we live in which our poor struggle with obesity? Something else happens when we start viewing our world as as scarce. What starts happening is we begin to view the people around us as threats to our security, competition for commodities. And if that begins to happen... We can't love people like Jesus did if we view them as as threats, as someone that's going to take our resources from us. We've got to release this. How do we get rid of this fear? Well, Jesus addressed it in Luke chapter 12 and verse 32. He's talking about the lilies of the field and and the birds of the air, how God takes care of them. He says, do not fear, for your Father has given you the kingdom. He's given you everything. Everything. If you're in the kingdom, you're in. He's going to provide for you. He says, what you need to do to get rid of your fear is go sell your possessions and give to the poor. It, what? What? 
If we're fearful, we, we try to get more to surround ourselves, to save up for a rainy day. He says, no, that just leads to fear. If you want to get rid of fear and, and allow yourself freedom to go serve and take care of others' burdens, both financially and, and with our time and our resources, he said, you've got to give it away. Because at that point, you have to rely on your Heavenly Father and say, I, I'm a child of His in the kingdom of God. I'm not adding a little God into my kingdom that I try to protect myself from those around me. People are not competition. For the widow of Zarephath and for us, burden bearing requires faith. Burden bearing requires faith for us to step out there. You know, sure enough, this woman took the step of faith and just as Elijah said, there was enough. There was plenty enough flour. There was plenty enough oil to take care of Elijah and her family. Burdens are lighter if they're born together. You know, the widow would need every bit of this faith as they go into this next challenge. And what's going to happen next? In 1 Kings 17, verse 17, it says, Sometime later, the the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and, and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, "What, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come here to remind me of my sin and to kill my son? He says, give me your son. He took him from her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying. Laid him on his bed. He cried out to the Lord. Oh, Lord, my God. Have you brought tragedy also upon this widow that I'm staying with by causing her son to die? When the boy stops breathing, the woman is fearful that her lifestyle And her separation from God has led to this tragedy happening in her life. Elijah said, that's not the case. Let me take him up. And so, even though it's kind of odd, he lays the boy out. And and he lays down on top of him. Almost like he's begging the Lord, saying, let my life transfer into his. Three times he gives up this, this prayer to God, save this child. I, I don't know why it took three, three prayers. But as a reminder to each of us, we've got to keep praying for the things that we're passionate about to let our Heavenly Father know that God can save both this woman and their son. So, hey, thanks. So even so, Elijah's faith in the midst of this uncertainty allows God to use him and demonstrate his life-giving power and compassion, even on this woman that's outside of Israel. So three times he does this, and God raises the boy back to life. Elijah carries him back down to his mother. 1 Kings 17 and 24, this is the result. The woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. Burdens are lighter if they're born together. She understands that the same God that sustained her with the oil and the flour has now brought her son back to her. This is what's going on. Burdens are lighter if they're born together. And the final point is burden bearing points us to God. In the midst of all of this, she gets beyond these physical things of eating and even her son losing his life to realize there's a deeper spiritual reality that she has to tap tap into. She sees firsthand, this is truth. All my life I've been living in in another way, but now this has been demonstrated by this prophet, this man of God coming in saying, Baal is, is, is worthless. Your ways of pursuing this world have proved fruitless. You've now got to come to our Heavenly Father, to Yahweh, to see He truly is the conduit for God's grace and his healing. And the woman willingly acknowledges for the first time this new spiritual reality. It happens in that room where you have this prophet bearing this burden with her. So that becomes a marker for our community of life and community. Someone who's willing to step in and bear a burden with someone. John 13 verse 35 says, By this People will know that you're my disciples, not by your truth, but by the way it's lived out, by the love you have for one another. At this time, I'm going to invite Daphne Osby and Melissa Teague to come up, and I want to share a story that 
in Relea's story, so if you guys want to come on up, that took place over the summer. Those of you who don't know, Daphne, she and her son Jack, you guys have been here at Twickenham how long? Uh, a little over two years now. A little over two years. And they, things are going fine. You, you had met a, a, a few folks, and you always sat back there in, in, in that corner, but didn't know a whole lot of people. Is, is that true? Right. I kind of had my place, uh, and then worked with the children's ministry, uh, stayed with the kids. <laughs> Okay, so things were, were going fine. You, you are a single parent. You're holding things together, and, and life's going okay until you started feeling a little bit bad and went to your doctor's office and shared just a little bit with the congregation uh, what the prognosis was, what, what he had shared with you. Okay, uh, yeah, was, life was going good. I was two months into a brand-new job, and my doctors found a tumor, a fairly sizable tumor, and it was cancer. And because of the size of the tumor and the indications that it had already started to spread, uh, we decided not to operate. And instead, we went immediately into chemo and radiation therapy. Okay. So uh, for those of you that have dealt with, with cancer, my, you know, my dad uh, passed away of, of cancer. So I, I know that journey through walking through it with him. It's very difficult because on, on top of all of the emotional things that come with it, it's very taxing and trying physically but you also had another element in that you were dealing with financial struggles as well that, that came out of these treatments. Just share a little bit about that. Right. Uh, at first, it was just um, your normal office co-pays, uh, maybe a $100 statement every here and there. And it wasn't until towards the end of my treatments that the bigger bills started rolling in, uh, $500 bill, $800 bill. And I thought, okay, well, I've got to find somewhere that I can cut back, you know, what can Jack and I do without for a while to kind of offset the medical expenses. And then when treatments ended, what I thought was big got even bigger, uh, $1,100 bill, a $3,300 bill. That's when I, I kind of realized that... It's bigger it, than what you could handle. Right, that, that I couldn't do this alone. And so you end up coming by the office just to talk a little bit about it. And I've been following up with you on how the cancer treatments were going, but then you kind of share some of this and, and my first reaction was let's just write you a check let, let's get this taken care of let's let your Twickenham family be a blessing to you and you said that's not really what I want to do so what was your plan that you came up with right and a lot of that was the, the pride thing that you talked about that being independent and doing things on my own for so long it's really hard for me to take help from somebody else it, it kind of played with my pride but I had in my head had already formulated a plan and I was going to have this yard sale. I like yard selling and I like working, you know, for, for what I get. So I decided I was going to have a yard sale and that anybody who wanted to help could just donate anything around the house that they don't have and I'll sell it in the yard sale. Okay. Now, you had a few friends on Facebook and at work and uh, from where you had come from that start dropping off a few things by the house. Uh, but really, it's not gaining a whole lot of traction. Um, and we happen to be going through this summer our spiritual disciplines, and I happen to be talking that week on uh, living simply, and so we put out a, a call to the, converse, to the congregation. If you've got extra things, we'll bring it up. Remember, we parked the yellow truck, so uh, everyone's supposed to bring stuff on Tuesday, I mean on Wednesday, and Melissa ended up calling, and she just said, well, I, I've got a few things, and some other folks too, and I drove by, I I didn't realize that when I said I would come to your house to pick up stuff, that meant Monday and Tuesday I was all over. The, but I started picking things up, and then Melissa, you, you called, and you kind of got involved in the story. Uh, what, what about Daphne? And um, a lot of people didn't even know that's what we were collecting the things for. Uh, but what about Daphne's story made you want to engage and hop into her life? Well, about this time in our life, um, my prayer was God open my eyes to the needs of others. And I kept praying that over and over. I felt like the Lord had blessed our family greatly, and in turn, that would cause us to be more generous to others. I was blessed with parents who had taught me to give and give generously, and I felt like I had not done that in the past few years. 
So Mark and I started collecting before we knew you and collecting things that we had extras of and we thought there would be a need, someone could use these. We started asking around and we found out there was a great need and I felt this is where it needed to go and this is how I met her. And you had just preached the sermon with the scoops of Luke 6, um, 638, give and it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure, measure you use, it will be measured to you. And it really had an effect on me. And I thought, I am not doing enough to glorify God. And um, so that's why we collected these things, and I was able to meet Daphne and get to know her. I, I was overwhelmed when I went over to y'all's house, and it, it, a lot of times people, if it's a toy, it's a truck with three wheels that you got, you guys were giving just some, some very useful things that you just weren't using at the time, but very valuable things, and, and so we filled up the rest of the truck all the way at the top, and so Tuesday afternoon, we show up at your house, and I think you were a little overwhelmed that we had a rider truck floor to ceiling filled with things. Yes, that's the, that's the right understatement. Way. <laughs> <laughs> I've met, I was sick this Sunday to preach the sermon, so I missed the sermon. You called me and you said, "I've got some donations, make some room." So so I did. And then you called again. And you said, "I've got a truck full of stuff. Are you sure you've got space?" And in my mind, I'm thinking you've got an F-150, you know, loaded down with straps. And Brad shows up to my house, and it's the extra large rider moving trucks from door, like you said, door to cab, floor to ceiling. And I mean, over surprise, overwhelmed. I guess a good way to explain it is once he made the first delivery, he uh, we got everything into the garage, packed full. He came and made a second delivery. My kitchen, my living room, part of my bedroom, my whole house was filled with things. I had a path going from the outside through the garage to my bed and to my bathroom. Yeah, Jack had to sleep in the backyard. It it was great. (laughs) In the doghouse. (laughs) No, the the night before the yard sale, I I found a spot, and I sat down, and I just started crying. And Jack came in, and he says, Mom, what's wrong? And I told him, I said, Jack, there's just a whole lot of people who we don't even know that really love us, and we're going to be okay. It It was really touching. Now, as you went through this and your treatments and even after, it wasn't just um, the second and third load of stuff that we brought over, but it was all the meals and people checking in on you. What, what did that mean that uh, for a church family, you're just getting to know at, at your time of absolute, Lord, I've got to have help that the Lord provided it in this way? Yeah, I, it's hard to put it into words because, um, you know, everything happened so fast. Uh, physically and and with the with the medical things that were happening that I didn't actually think because you know everybody said well how can you help what can we do and I I just kept saying well keep praying keep praying but uh, Nancy Jackson set up a website and some ladies wanted to help some way so they started bringing me meals and I didn't realize until they started doing that how much of a blessing it actually was because I continued to work full-time through my treatments and after doing that and then coming home to Jack, it, the last thing I wanted to do was stand up and you know cook dinner. So just just a small act of bringing food over, and most of whom I I had seen here at church, but you know just don't walk up to and say how my name is, you know. But I meet them by them coming to my house and you know taking time out of their day to fix a meal and bring it to me. It was uh, really eye opening and. Yep. Now, when Jill and I do garage sales, it's more to just get rid of things, and we're happy if we uh, make about 150. Uh, How much did you raise uh, over the two days with your garage sale? Sure. Um, I got a bill in right before the garage sale, and the one that kind of floored me, it was a statement for $3,528.54. And when I took the money to the bank after the yard sale, I took $3,720 to the bank. And if that's not a God thing, I don't know what is. Absolutely. Uh, but Absolutely. I just, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Do you believe in this statement that burdens lighter if they're born together? Absolutely. Absolutely. I just want to thank you and Melissa and everybody else who called and texted and emailed and sent cards and brought food and watched Jack and prayed 
because we're all praying for a cure, but I think sometimes, I heard this morning that sometimes your mess becomes your message, and I think, I just want to thank you guys for helping that happen with me. You bet. Let's tell them our appreciation. Thank you, guys. I guess if I have one, one word to, to share with you this morning is that Christians are not immune to adversity. James chapter 1 tells us that we're going to face trials of many kinds, but we're going to face them differently than those in the world. But they're designed to test our faith, and it's God's intention for this church as community to live life together, to live together in the trenches, because there are all kinds of burdens that people face. There are those that, that were mentioned by Brother Strickland, those that are facing sorrow and grief and, and sickness from physical health. And, and also, man, I just appreciate this Megan White and how her family has allowed us to walk through her ongoing illness with her for so long. And I, I had a tear as I was reading a Facebook post that says, our hearts ache, but we always have joy. Second Corinthians 6 and verse 10. So, and we need to be lifting up Megan as well. But I'm so grateful to see how her faith journey has just progressed as she's gone through this. But some are going through emotional difficulties and, and scars from the past and difficult marriages and, and rebellious children that, that they're dealing with. Then there are those that are going through unemployment or underemployment and those that are dealing with unrepentant sin. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 that talks about bearing with each other's burdens that's not talking about just physical or financial needs. It's also talking about those that, that are overcoming sin together and, and how in community we can do that. So if you're going through this right now, don't go it alone. If, if you've got a burden, let someone else help. There's two action steps and the lesson is yours. First, if you know someone in need that, that has a burden, please get in there and help them. Take the initiative to walk through that trial and that valley with them. Use your time, your talents, and your treasures to help see them through. Secondly, if you're dealing with something on, on your heart, don't leave here this morning without sharing with others. Be up front with, with folks. We're going to have uh, elders in each of our three lobbies. I'm also going to ask our, our small group leaders and our Bible class teachers, stick around. Make yourself available. I don't want anyone to leave campus today without sharing what's going on in your life and allow this, this body of Christ here at Twickenham to bear this burden with you. That's my prayer for us. Let's love each other to those that, that need help, and let's be humble enough to allow others to help us. I, I promise burdens are lighter if they're born together. Let's show this mark of Christ. Let's show this, this mark of living in community.